<laughs> Hi, I am Farhan Tahir, and I am co-starring with my good friend Daryush Kashani in a play on Broadway called The Kite Runner. Uh, I play the character of Baba, uh, who is kind of a domineering father to the protagonist who narrates the story. Uh, or, and the story is about friendship, it's about betrayal, it's about um, fl flawed people, but it's also about redemption and hope. Um, and I'm right now sitting in my beautiful apartment with a bald head and a beard. <laughs> Over to you, Darren. <laughs> Hello, everybody in TDF land. Uh, I am Dariush Kishani. Um, and uh, Farhan, thank you for the lovely uh, intro. Uh, I play Rahim Khan. Um, I am Baba's close friend. I'm also a friend to the family. Um, I am kind of like a surrogate parent to uh, Amir Arison's character, Amir. Uh, who is the, um, the the center of the story? Uh, I become an, an advocate for him throughout the story, uh, and I am I have a beard and salt and pepper hair and a bland background of sorts. <laughs> All right. How familiar were you with The Kite Runner before signing on to the show? Uh, so in my case, uh, I had read the book when it first came out. Uh, and I had loved it. Because again, what I love about the book is that it is, it's not a grand, and it's not demonizing anyone, but it's humanizing everyone. Uh, what I love about the book is that although it's Kabul and Afghanistan in the 80s and the 70s, uh, that's, that's the background of it. But the story is a very human story. And when the story even moves to the U.S., you are still seeing these flawed people trying to rise above their own mistakes, their own, their own issues. And that's what drew me to the story, because it kind of connects people on a very human level. Uh, yes, I read the book when it first came out, uh, which for on how long would you say that is 20 years? I think it was, yeah, I think it was like about, about 2003 is I think when it came out. So about, yeah, about 19, 20 years. Right. Yeah, almost 20 years. And, and I remember vividly one passage where actually Baba and Rahim Khan are sitting, I think they're sitting on a carpet and drinking tea and just talking. And I just remember bursting into tears in that scene. And I honestly cannot remember why. But um, when I found out they were doing a play on Broadway, the first image that came into my mind was that day when I was reading the book and, that, and having that memory. So. All right, let's see, let's. <laughs> Another question. Father-son relationships are central theme of the play. Farhan, you play Amir's father, while Daryush, you play father figure to him. Tell us about your character's conflicting parenting styles. <laughs> well, um, the, the beauty of it is that I think we do play, we are the yin and the yang in the character Amir's life. Uh, uh, I am the one who, who is never satisfied with him, who is always trying to push him to be more like me. I don't accept him for who he is, which, which truly what love is. We, have, have to, we should accept people for who they are. And, and I think that is... Uh, you do see that there's a growth. Uh, I think my parenting style, although I grow, is still the one who's, who's a little bit more domineering, more pushy, uh, never satisfied with his son. That is, that is how, how my character deals with, with Amir's character. Hmm. And I would say, 
I wouldn't say it's the complete opposite because I understand how Baba needs to be with the mirror. Uh, and it's, and for me, it's like, I am, I'm loyal to the, the, the friendship and I would never disrespect Farhan's character in private when we have our scenes together, nor necessarily also in front of Amir, but being able to give Amir just another road to perhaps, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of, um, look down, you know, because uh, uh, we also have to remember we are from a completely different culture where we're all hardwired to be a certain way. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it comes down to both of us. We equally share a deep care for, for Amir. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, that is the thing that, that, and I think Darius just hit it uh, right, right, because yes, it is about also about cultures and how people deal with, in, those cultural, in, in those cultural settings uh, with family, with, with loved ones. And I think it kind of brings out that side. And it's, it's really, it, it is, we kind of complete the whole. The, the you know the parenting for for this boy um, between between uh, Darius's character Rahim Khan and mine we do have that feel that way mm. but that is at the center of the story we can go on to the next question yeah Right. Want me to read it, Farhan? The Kite Runner... You read it, yeah, you read it. The Kite Runner is also an immigration story. Each of you spent part of your childhood in your family's homeland. Can you share your immigration journeys? Farhan, you go. Yes, I come from Pakistan, which is right next door to Afghanistan, uh, and also right, no, right next door to Iran, where, where Daryush comes from. So we, we really, we are people from that particular area. And in my case, I, it's, it's interesting because I lived in Pakistan for the first 17 years. I was born in the U.S., uh, lived in, in Pakistan for the first 17 years. And funnily enough, well, not funnily, but, but strangely enough, one of the reasons that I had to move to, uh, to the U.S. was because of the Soviet-Afghan war that was going on and the impact was ha having on Pakistan at that point uh, because Pakistan being a big supporter of, of, of uh, Afghanistan and Afghanistan, if people don't know, is a landlocked country. So a lot of the aid and a lot of the arms were being uh, supplied through Pakistan, uh, through the port in Pakistan, through Karachi to Kabul. And it had some it, you know, there was support, but it also had some darker sides to it, uh, which was that in order to do so, uh, a lot of arms were being distributed along the way. And when you give people arms and don't give them means for a living, some bad things start to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was a young man, uh, you know, full of testosterone and not much, uh, much else. Uh, politically very active at that time against a, a dictatorship that was in Pakistan. And that was getting me into a lot of trouble. So uh, it just seemed, and my family decided that since I had an American passport, that it would be better for me um, and safer if I would just leave. Or maybe they just, they just wanted me out of the house. I don't know which one. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the excuse. But that is how I came here. I came in 1980, uh, a long, long, long time ago. And uh, it was it was an interesting it was an interesting experience because I come from a very lively city in Pakistan, one of the the, the second largest city, and I came to a very small, remote town in Colombia, uh, all by myself, uh, and. Sometimes I think weeks would go by before I would even hear my own voice uh, because I, I had no one, um, no one there. I had a, an uncle 
whose house I was staying at, but he was not there for, for a while. So it was a very strange experience. But at the same time, I will say that that experience made me or pushed me to kind of do some soul searching. So uh, there's a, there, there is a silver lining to it. Um, well, you know, it's funny. I have many similarities with uh, Faran in terms of timing and coming to this country. I came in 1979 with my family. Um, my mother's father uh, was involved in the government in Iran, but uh, the uh, under the Shah's regime. Um, we we weren't activists, but we were around people who were activists um, when the uh, Ayatollah uh, came into power, and it was just evident that it was time for us to leave. Um, and my family scattered too many places. A lot of them went to, to Pakistan, which is something that Farhan and I have spoken about at, at great length. And my the nuclear family, me, my mom, my brother and my father, we came to uh, Washington, D.C., where my grandparents were at the time. Um, they had been working in the uh, Iranian embassy in D.C., but the, when, once the embassy shut down, they no longer had their, their jobs. Um, and in, in the same way that Baba and Amir uh, in the story come to America with very little, uh, they came with two suitcases. I, th I think we came with three. And in one of the suitcases was a Persian rug. So basically two suitcases. <laughs> um, and uh, at nightly, when I listen to the play, I, I usually have the memory of when we first, um, after we came here and we, we were getting letters from immigration saying that we were going to get deported. And this was a, a recurring thing that happened like every six months. You're being deported. Fly to New York City immediately from D.C. and, and get the hell out of the country and go back. And uh, eventually we got a lawyer and we were able to stay. But, um, you know, those, those are very difficult times, um, especially being an Iranian, because there was uh, the hostage crisis that, that happened when we moved to this country. And Iranians were not welcome. Uh, I mean, especially in Washington, D.C., where it was filled with, you know, military and, and, and diplomats and political people. So um, ultimately, it's a, it's a, um, every character in the play, their story of survival is, reflects onto my story of survival. And my story of survival then reflects back onto the play, which is what I think is very exciting an exciting thing to do, but also it's challenging, you know, because you have to think about things that you may not have necessarily thought about in a long time. It's common to hear gasps, laughter, and tears as the kite runner's emotional tale unfolds. What are your most memorable audience reactions? Well, I think all of them. And, and I think that's, that's what's so beautiful about the play, that we have been very blessed, I will say, that literally, and I don't want to jinx it, that uh, when, we, when the play ends, audiences literally erupt out of their seats. And that shows to me that they're listening to every word that's being said and, and seeing every image and, and, and understanding it or, or, or processing it in their own way. And, and all those reactions to me are so, so pure and so raw that I, I've all, I always have believed that, especially for live theater, uh, the final character in the play is always the audience. And the sense of tragedy and the sense of comedy that they bring, or, 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 or all of their senses that they bring to that room that day, have, have an authenticity to it. And, and if we can match that authenticity uh, by doing, by telling a story, uh, then, then, we have, then we have magic in the room. And, and we have heard, literally, we have heard people not only gasp, like last night, somebody at, at one point literally, we could hear the audience, uh, uh, audience member 
cry out raw and that emotional for them. And by the same token, there's some really beautiful uh, moments of levity in the play. And, and, I, and I love that the juxtaposition of this dark and the light and that the audiences come with us on this journey. They literally, it, it's again, such an honor that they feel that they, they're in good hands and they can come on this journey and take all the twists and turns with us and stay with us throughout, throughout this story, which unfolds over two and a half hours. So to me, literally all of those moments are, are enjoyable. And every day I listen for them because something new, new emotions, some new reactions, some new, uh, some new gasp or laughter comes from the audience in a place where I might not think that you know, we, we would get that. And yet we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I'm sure Farhan will agree with me. It's extremely validating to know that an audience is with you, especially when the, when they get extremely vocal or expressive. And so we've even, we've heard words like, I think last night somebody said, Jesus, <laughs> and, uh, uh, it was, you know, we don't reject, we, we don't reject these things. And on the, on the flip side, we've even had moments where the audience has been so still and so silent, silent, and I say that that is equal to the gasps and to the thing, you know, that, that, there, that an, an audience is a, a very, very quiet audience is a very strong lis listening audience. And then eventually they will let us know, you know, at whatever point in the story that they're with us. In, and then, of course, there's the curtain call, which is, of the most obvious places where an audience expresses itself. But Farhan, I know I th our audiences are amazing. They, they, are, they are very expressive and appreci appreciative. And, and, you know, they finally get to have a big release at the end, which, which sometimes yeah. they, they may not feel comfortable completely letting go while they're watching the show, you know. Yeah, and, and I will say, you know, the, something that, that as, as an actor uh, and Dariush will... will will agree with me that whoever is the first actor who gets off stage, the first question the actors backstage will ask that actor is, well, how's the audience today? You know, because we, we feed off the energy of, of, of the audience. And, and again, I can't say it enough how blessed we are for the kind of audiences that we have been experiencing in, in this play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, New York audiences can be tough. Um, when, <laughs> when, when you have a new, a New Yorker who is very vocal and you hear them responding to you because you know, you know, it's a New Yorker in the audience, you, you know, and, you know, that is like the cherry on top of the Sunday. Um, so thank you, New York audiences. <laughs> yeah, really. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You, you take this one. Okay, Broadway rarely centers story of Middle Eastern life. What are your hopes for expanded representation on stage? Well, uh, I'll, I say the first hope is our, our, our region has been called the Middle East or this or that, you know, for a very, very, very long time. But this gives us an opportunity now to be even like more specific about what you know, where in the world is Afghanistan? Where, where in the world is Pakistan? Where in the world is Iran? So, for example, when I hear Middle East, I never think of Iran or Pakistan or Afghanistan. So Afghanistan, to, to, be, to give it its appropriate geographic location, is Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Right, Farhan? Yeah. And, Farhan, absolutely. And, and where would you put Pakistan and, well, so and Pakistan, Iran? Yeah, Pakistan... So Part of, of Afghanistan is Central Asia, and then I think part of it, the South could probably also be, you can call it South Asia at the same time. Mm -hmm. Pakistan mm -hmm. is also kind of like a hybrid because we are, we are kind of South Asians, but we are sandwiched between uh, Iran, Afghanistan, China, and India. So that's, right. that's our geographical you know, uh, placement. So, yeah, I mean, and, and I think you're right, Dariush. I think sometimes uh, there is a broad stroke 
of Middle Eastern that goes goes about. And yes, we share. We sh there, are, there are a lot of you know there are a lot of common commonalities that we share, but mm -hmm. we and we celebrate those. But there are also there are also some some wonderful rich differences that we should also celebrate. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. Yes. Like Europe, Europe is a continent, uh, yet it has such diversity. And so does the Middle East or, or that part of the world. So my hope, yeah. one thing, my hope is that we start to look at these things and, and celebrate these, these, these identities, these differences, these similarities that we have. And also at the same time, realize that, you know, underneath all of this, we're all humans, you know, and we have the same issues that a person who's sitting, I don't know, in Oklahoma has uh, as, as a person sitting in Tehran does. You know, we're all trying to yeah. make a living. We're all trying to raise a family. And what I, my hope is that although we are, we're here and we are kind of, we are a patch in the American quilt, what I what I'm hoping is that we are we slowly become part of the thread of the American fabric, where where we where we understand the differences, but the differences don't separate us; they actually bring us together. So the more stories that we can bring from different parts of the world, especially that part of the world, because that part of the world has seen a lot of ups and downs and a lot of tragedy and a lot of utility, uh, I think that that would be good because I think it's about time that we start to create that dialogue. And without dialogue, understanding doesn't come. Mm -hmm. uh, we have come to a point in our lives and, you know, taking a, a, a term from our world, which is, I always feel that we have come to a point in, in, in this world where we do a lot of monologuing, where I, I will express my view, but not listen to yours. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and you will express your view and you won't listen to mine. And mm -hmm. I think we need to create dialogues with mm -hmm. people. And I think mm -hmm. there's no better way to do it but to by, by sharing stories. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's, what, that's where we find commonality, we find connection, and we find empathy for each other. I, I agree completely. Yep. I would have to say it's no, it, 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 it's no surprise to me that I've always lived in the city New York City being my, my home for, you know, I'll say over 25 years, where um, if, if I want to look for people who look like me, I didn't have to step out far from my front door to find them. Um, whether, and of course, whether that's represented in theater or, or, or music or food. Um, uh, I mean, New York is just rich with those things. Um, so now what a, what a fortunate position to be in to have the kite run on Broadway. Cause look, I've done other shows. Ferran's done other shows where we've played, you know, people from our, our part of the world. But, you know, now we have a situation where it's like across the board um, and people can now come and see us in, in a different, in a different light. Um, but that different light is no different from the person who's your neighbor or the person who, uh, you see every day at work, uh, or the person who owns the, the, the restaurant that you love to go to, where you want to have food from, from Iran or, or Pakistan or Morocco or wherever, you know, I mean, um, we're, we're just people. Um, and, uh, and, and we all, and we all came here, uh, because we were displaced, right. For a variety of reasons. And the unfortunate thing that I think, well, I'll just say for my family that happened was when, when we came, we realized very quickly that we needed to assimilate to be accepted. But now after so many years, and as, as, as Farhan said, with all the ups and downs that happen in the world, um, it puts stories from other countries in, in people's faces. I mean, you're watching the news and you're seeing things that happen here, happen there, you know, unfortunate things like 9-11, but it just continues to expose um, uh, uh, our, our, our culture to the world. Um, so then the next kind of thing that I think we, we've all had to deal with is 
is then when you're trying to make a living as an actor, it's like, well, you're being associated with a certain event or a certain country, but mm -hmm. there's nothing in you that is linked to that. But it's just, just because you're from there, you're, you know, well, you're going to play this part, you're going to play that part. So working through all of that and coming out of it and now saying, but we're just people. Yeah. Um, I think, I think is the, is, 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 is the foothold of representation. Um, uh, and I know Ron and I have talked many times about uh, in some of the scenes we have together where, you know, we just didn't want to be, you know, um, talking heads from other countries. We want to be on stage and have our scenes together and represent a parental figure or a friend in, in, a, in appropriate ways that are, um, uh, uh, that are familiar to audiences. All right. Most fathers in the kite runner dismiss their kids' artistic dreams, hoping they choose more practical pursuits. Were your families always supportive of your <laughs> acting aspirations? <laughs> well, uh, so in my case, uh, it was it was strange, and I'll tell you why. Because my family has been in theater uh, for a very long time. I'm I'm a third generation. Uh, theater person. I literally grew up backstage. But by the same token, uh, when I asked my parents or, or declared that I was going to be an actor, for many, many, many years, my, I, and in those, day, in those days, there, was, there were no emails or, or texts or anything, so you, so you wrote letters. Uh, and my father and I had this back and forth where he would keep asking me, why? Why do I want to be an actor? And it frustrated me to no end uh, because I thought it would be all rah, 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 go for on, you know, go conquer and all of that. But it wasn't that. It was a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I, I totally understand it. And, and finally, something he said to me, which I mean, after seven years, I think seven years of, of writing back and forth, I guess one letter kind of like uh, finally gave him the answer of some, some sort. And he said, you know, I don't know if you, have, if you have talent or not, but I think you'll be okay. But remember this, that the reason I did all of this and went back and forth with you is because in this business, success and failure both can ruin you if you're not grounded. And I thought that was, that was, a, that was a beautiful lesson to learn. Um, you know, he wanted, no parent wants their child to be, you know, not to realize their dreams, but also does not want them to be a broken person in the end. And in my case, uh, all because I come from an artistic family, and yet it wasn't just go do it. It was, it was really trying to prepare me for what was yet to come and how I was going to deal with it. How would I save my core or, and keep moving forward given the ups and downs and the tribulations and the trials of, of, of this particular art form. Uh, there's a lot of, there's acceptance, but there's also a lot of rejection. And how do you save yourself? And how do you still, you use all of that as fuel to your fire rather than the fire that burns you to, to ashes. So in my case, that's, that's how it kind of unfolded. Well, I, I don't think my little story is um, unfamiliar to anybody from our part of the world or even other parts of the world. I mean, even in this country where, where you know, wanting to pursue the arts, um, uh, acting specifically was like, I, you know, I was an embarrassment to the family and the community. And, <laughs> I was, and, my, and my brother was studying engineering and uh, in college and he, you know, he was doing very, very, very well in school. And, um, and I, I was pre-med and then I changed to, um, a theater degree, um, at the end of my freshman year. And, and unfortunately came down to a very difficult conversation I had with my parents. Cause I, 
I kind of went behind their back and I took a couple of acting classes at my undergrad and then I got cast in the school play and I wanted them, wanted them to come and see the school play, but it would obviously reveal that I had been doing it behind their back. Um, and I had a girlfriend at the time who um, they felt had influenced me to do this, but nobody had influenced me. It was just something I wanted to do. So they gave me a choice. They said, you can do the play, but you got to dump the girl. And, it's like, <laughs> and she may be watching this. She's, she's, she may be a TDF subscriber, but anyway. Um, so I, I, I dumped the girl. Uh, and, <laughs> and that was, and that was the end. But, but of course it's a very simple story which continued to have more layers of complication over the years because um, uh, my parents were worried that I just would not be able to sustain myself financially. And that's ultimately what it always comes down to is a, 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 a parent's concern for a child is, can you make a living doing this? Yeah. So ultimately, at the end of the day, their, their views were, we don't really care what you do, but we just want to make sure that you can survive and now my both of my parents are deceased um it's unfortunate that they they've, they've been gone for a while it's unfortunate they were not here to see this play because i think it would have been a full circle um experience for them uh but yeah yeah it is funny though because i i still remember um years later i had kids and all of that and one of my aunts pulled me aside and was like i need to talk to you and i was like all right <laughs> It's like now, now that you have kids in a family, now will you get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Although the kite runner is ultimately an uplifting journey, there are scenes of violence and betrayal along the way. How do you decompress post performance? Uh, I just call Farhan or text him. Yep, that's what we do. That's literally what we do. We, I, uh, I, what I do is I, I live, you know, in, in Lower East Side, and the theater is on Broadway, and I usually walk to the theater to focus myself, which is about an hour's walk, and then I walk back after the show, which is about an hour's walk, and I decompress. And literally, Darius and I, while I'm walking, we are texting the entire time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so just talking about the play, talking about things, and that's really our our, our you know our decompression uh, process. <laughs> yeah, you know it speak, It actually speaks to the quality of the friendship because you still you're we're, we're still leaning on each other when the whole thing is over because uh, yeah. it's not it's not over. I mean, it's never over. So after we're done, you know. Um, speaking to one another, um, I, I pretty much fall asleep pretty quickly. But when I wake up in the morning, the play and the previous performance uh, is still kind of, you know, on, on the, it's fresh in my mind. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really never over. I mean, I, I, I always think that what happens with, with theater is that one day you run out of time to rehearse. But the process and the growth never stops. I mean, it doesn't even stop even after you close the show. There are times when you wake up in the middle of the night and go, ah, I should have done that or, or whatever, you know. So that process keeps on going on. And yes, you, you decompress, but while you're decompressing, you're also processing through the the, the, the experience of, of the night, of past nights, of, of the entire experience of being involved and immersed in, in, in a world because you literally have two worlds living within you when you're doing, when you're doing this. There's a world that you know, Dariush and I have, which is our world, Farhan and Dariush in, in, in New York or whatever. But then there's a world that we share on stage. And that world is as active in our heads, in our minds, in our souls as the world that, that we experience on our own uh, every day. Yeah. And I just want to add to that. I mean, when I'm working with Farhan on stage, I don't feel like I'm acting. I mean, 
the uh, the quality of our, our of our engagement off stage always carries on. Uh, on yeah, which is and, funny because I, I'll tell you something. Uh, the first day when when we we were about to do our reading, you know, I was walking the street. And I hear Faram uh, from across the street. And who is it? It's Darius. I mean, and, and it's funny, you know, that, that we play best of friends on, on, on stage, but, but without even trying to make that connection, th that connection is there. And that's yeah. one of the beautiful gifts that I will take away from this play in my personal life. Me too. All right, I'll read this one. A kite competition figures prominently in the kite runner. What contest did you compete in as kids? Well, to be very honest, uh, coming from Pakistan, I did uh, compete in, in kite in kite competitions. It is a huge thing in Pakistan uh, to the point where sometimes the government has to decide whether we're going to have a competition that you're not because things get pretty darn crazy. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know, you know, kite flying very intimately, but at the same time, I was, uh, I was a soccer player, which is something that I talk about in the, in, in the show. Uh, I want my son to be a soccer player, and he's a terrible, abysmal soccer player in, 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 in the show. I played soccer. Uh, I come from a part of the world, uh, especially Pakistan, which is very big in cricket. So I played cricket. Um, I was a track runner. Uh, I ran. Uh, you know, I was a sprinter. I was. I have also done marathon. So, so that was basically that was basically my all of my sports. Um, I I tried playing soccer, um, <laughs> and uh, and and I would come home. Uh, Farhan, actually, I've never told you this story, so you're going to relate to this in terms of the play. So I would come home, and my dad. Would and he would come and see the you know the the, the practices and stuff and, and he would tell me how awful I was, <laughs> and, and then and then he said you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask them if I can coach the team because the the coach that we had had knee issues and he was just getting run down, so my dad came and started coaching the team, and he didn't give me any help he he, he was like. <laughs> He was like coaching all the other guys. Other way, I'm like the whole point of this was you were supposed to come and help me get better. And then he looked at me. And he was like, "But you know what? You're not that good." So I just ran out of <laughs> well, which, which 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 reminds me that you know when my son started playing soccer, you know I, I wanted him to play soccer. My my actual son Javan, you know I wanted him to play soccer, and of course I was like in there like trying to like give him pointers and stuff. And finally he came. I was like, you know what, Papa. I don't want to play soccer. I want to play something that you have never played so you can get off my back. So he chose lacrosse. And I had no experience in lacrosse. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Farhan, have you ever been to the TKTS booth? You must have. I have. What's yeah, the best yeah, yeah. deal you ever got at the TKTS booth? Um, I don't, yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, the best deal that I ever got was somebody who kind of recognized me from my work and just gave me the tickets. Really? Yeah. That is that is the best deal. That is that is the, that's the best deal that I've got, and I think you can't you can't beat that deal. Well, many years ago, okay, let me try to remember. Um, it's got to be the late '90s. I mean, some somebody at TDF will know this, but. So they were doing two trains running on Broadway uh, by August Wilson. And um, Lawrence Fishburne was the main lead. A friend of mine who is no longer with us, Anthony Chisholm, well, he wasn't a friend back then, but he became a friend, was in the play. Um, and it was an amazing production. And I saw it five times. And I believe... Um, I got, I got, I went to TKTS and I got $40 tickets and they were always good tickets, but this was one of those rare, rare, rare experiences. Um, 
in not not just Broadway, but but I just think theatrical experiences where I was like, I want to go and see that play every chance I get, and I want to hear those words, and I want to see those performers because there are many other brilliant, brilliant, brilliant um, actors in that production, but. It was look. I would have paid a hundred bucks, but I didn't have a hundred bucks back then. And I was a I was a waiter at uh, Jr's restaurant in Hell's Kitchen, which is no longer there. Um, uh, but yeah, that was the best deal. <laughs> All right, you go first. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Last question. Ron, if I was if I was your agent, once this show is over, what role would I? Well, I, I if I'm your agent, I can't cast you in a role, but I would look for something for you. So, you know what? Okay, this is the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, you would be uh, uh, either Indiana Jones or James Bond. It's one of the two, because <laughs> you know they. They need a new 007. They do, um, Daniel right? Craig. Is Daniel yeah, Craig I... watching this right now? Macbeth closed. He's probably not even here anymore. So, Daniel Craig, thank you. You had your run. Farhan Tahir is the next 007. Huh. Well, see, now now you've set the bar like, like you know. See, if, if I was your agent, if I was your agent, you know, knowing this man and, and, and really, and I'm not like, I'm not uh, just being facetious. Knowing this man's talent, I swear that this man can pretty much pull anything off. Oh, thank Literally. you. Literally, he can pull, pull anything off. If I was his agent, I would be one of the richest people in the world <laughs> because I would literally try to get him cast in anything and everything that, that, that is out there. I mean, literally, this man is a thank chameleon. You. Thank you. Uh, he, I, you. You see it in the show. I mean, the way he switches from, from character to character, from accents to accents. You know, it's it's a gold mine. It's a gold mine. And and if if Darush's agent is is hearing this and he should, I am telling you guys, cash in, <laughs> cash Thank in you. on this. Thank you. Well, I mean, Ferran fits the 007 mold not only physically, but but with with charm and magnetism, which which override, you know, every every, every other ability he has. He is an extremely charming, sweet, and accessible person. Uh, you know, you don't want James Bond to just be like, you know, a, a, a walking two by four, <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've told Fran many times that uh, I, I was aware of him long before we met and long before we did this play. So, um, it's it's a it's a pretty it's it's a pretty sweet deal to be acting in a play with him. And 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 I will say this that you know, whatever we are cast as, I hope that we are cast together as many times as we possibly can be. Because yeah. it's it's been such a gift and a blessing that Thank you, brother. I want Thank to do you. this over and over again. It keeps me sane, it keeps me happy, and it keeps me Thank wanting you. to come back every day. Thank you. And he, you know, he has saved, saved my, can I, can you say ass? He has saved my butt a couple of times on stage. Uh, well, uh, there was even a moment last night where, <laughs> where I was on another planet, uh, but Ferran was there to, to, to save me and, and restore the play. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the fun, man. That's the fun of live theater, you know? And it is. Who knows tomorrow, t tonight, you might be doing that for me, you know? There's, there's no, there's no guarantee. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah. None. If you see my head go down, you know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you, TDF. Thank you. Farhan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darius. Thank you, TDF, for giving us this opportunity to just have a chat, uh, you know, off stage. This is fun. A lot of fun. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>